Certain units and strategies get better the more you know about them. You will struggle to make a siege push work in Castle Age if all you know is to build a siege workshop forward. Knowing how to balance your economy for it, which units to build, how to control your siege, how to protect your siege, and in which situations you should even go for a siege push are all things that you must learn in order to become proficient with this strategy. It's not as simple as just making the units and sending them to attack the enemy. The same can be said for monks. If you just make some monks but don't know what you're doing with them, then they may end up being a complete waste of resources. Today I'm going to go through almost everything important to know about monks in Age of Empires 2. By the end of this video, you should have a good enough understanding of monks to know when to add them and what text to get for them, as well as how to combat them when your opponent goes for them. So let's sit back and get to the- Bono. Let's get started with the basics. Monks have three primary functions, to convert enemy units, to heal your own units, and to pick up relics. There are icons that you can press to convert or heal units, but usually just right clicking the enemy to issue the command is enough. The only situations where these buttons could potentially be useful is when there's a big melee fight and you want to make sure to either convert or heal units, but this sacrifices some speed for accuracy, so it's not frequently done. When you convert an enemy unit, not only do you gain a unit, but your opponent also loses a unit. This swing in army value almost always pays for the monk even if he dies directly after. If this is the case, then why not make your entire army out of monks? The problem with this is that you have to individually command each of your monks to convert different targets. This requires very fast and very precise mouse movements, where even at the human limit, monks cannot be controlled nearly as fast as what an AI would be capable of. This also means that by improving your mouse speed and accuracy, your monk micro will improve. The same applies in reverse. If you practice monk micro, you will become faster and more accurate, which will help many other aspects of your gameplay. The basic idea for how conversions work is that monks have a minimum and maximum time it takes before their conversion is successful. This time is represented in monk seconds. After 4 monk seconds, there's a small chance that you'll get a fast as possible conversion. After 10 monk seconds, if the target isn't converted yet, you're guaranteed a conversion. After a successful conversion, any monks that were converting the target have to rest until their faith is at 100% again, which takes 62 seconds. When a unit is converted, it retains its stats that it had the moment it switches sides. You can't upgrade it or change its stats in any way except for its HP. You can still lose HP and heal it. If an obu strips armor from your converted unit, then when you heal it back to full HP, the defense stats return to the state at which you converted the unit. A common question that gets asked is how upgrades work on converted units and whether civ bonuses affect them. First, we must understand how upgrades are applied to units. When you research an upgrade, a property is set on all current and future units that are affected by that upgrade, excluding converted units. This applies to all upgrades that affect a unit's stats, such as attack, defense, and hit points, as well as hidden stats such as attack speed and accuracy. You can see how when I research Bodkin Arrow, Crossbowen, and Thumbring, the effects are all applied to the non-converted unit, but not to the converted one. This is because all of these upgrades apply to the units, and exclude converted units. You might be thinking, don't all upgrades apply to units? Well, there are a few exceptions that people get confused on. Some upgrades apply to the projectile that a unit fires, and not the unit itself. Since projectiles are created when a unit shoots, they don't have the limitations that converted units have. The notable upgrades where you can see this effect are Ballistics and Archibus, and the Fire Effect from Chemistry. Converted units' projectiles get the effect from Ballistics because that effect is applied to the projectile, and not the converted unit. 
for chemistry. The converted unit does not get the plus one attack from the upgrade, but they still fire cool flame arrows as the visual effect is applied to the projectile. An example of a civilization bonus where you can see this in action is the Spanish faster cannonballs from cannon galleons. A converted cannon galleon will start shooting high speed cannonballs as soon as they're converted to the Spanish side. Civilization bonuses that just affect a unit's stats such as Saracen's bonus damage versus buildings and Ethiopian faster firing archers are applied on unit creation, so if your opponent is Ethiopians, then if you convert an archer, it will fire faster, but if you're Ethiopians and you convert an archer, then it will fire slower than your other archers. There's one other question related to this topic, and that's how do converted building bonuses affect them? It's kind of the same as units, except that there are some different properties that exist. Building stats such as extra HP and defense for masonry are carried over and can't be upgraded further. Conscription also doesn't affect converted buildings, but if you're Aztecs and convert a military building, then that building will work 11% faster because of your civilization bonus. If you're Teutons and you have crenellations, converted towers and donjons will fire extra arrows if garrisoned by infantry. They don't get additional garrison space though, as that's set when the building is created. Ballistics and chemistry work the same for buildings as they do for units, as the effects are applied to the projectile. If your opponent doesn't have heresy and you convert one of their buildings, and then you have heresy and they convert it back, then the building will die when they convert it back. Healing is the second thing that you use your monks for. It's much less complicated than conversions. Monks will automatically heal your own and allied units that are nearby, and they heal at a rate of 150 HP per minute. If you use multiple monks to heal one unit, similar to repair villagers, additional monks after the first one only add 75 HP per minute. Therefore, additional monks work at only 50% the rate of the first one. If you have multiple monks in an area, they're smart enough to heal different units, but if there are less units to heal than there are monks, they will not stack their heals on one target. The extra monks will just idle in this situation. Unlike repairing buildings, healing units doesn't cost resources. The third function of monks is to pick up relics. When you put a relic in your monastery, it adds a trickle of 30 gold per minute to your stockpile, which is equivalent to one villager with gold shaft mining upgrade. Most maps in 1v1 have 5 relics on them, so even in the late game stalemate situations, one player will always have more resources coming in, which will eventually lead to that player gaining advantages. Since each relic is only worth one villager, trying to collect them too early can be an inefficient use of your resources. Spending your early Castle Age resources on more town centers or military will often pay off much sooner than adding a monastery and monks to collect relics. But as with everything in this game, it can depend on a lot of factors. On Arena for example, collecting relics as soon as possible on Castle Age is a very common strategy, as if you get the relic advantage, you can play defensively until they pay off because you start with stone walls and no easy way to raid your villagers. If you're unsure when to collect relics, mid castle age to while you're researching imperial age is good. At this point, the investment of 175 wood for the monastery and a few hundred gold for some monks is not too much. You just have to remember to do it. Collecting relics also helps with scouting the map, which can spot neutral golds and stone and enemy sneak villagers. On the latter, the conquest victory condition is set, but if standard victory is set, then collecting all of the relics will start a countdown where, if you hold all of the relics for that long, you will win the game. This is basically the same thing as when you finish constructing a wonder with standard victory set. As with most units, you need to consider the upgrades that you can get when going monks. There are many upgrades that you can research in the monastery, and we'll go through each of them so you'll have a better understanding of which ones to pick up in which situations. We'll start with the ones that affect your monk's stats directly. Sanctity increases HP by 15, Fervor increases movement speed by 15%, Block Printing increases range by 3, and Illumination makes your monks only require 33 seconds to rest instead of 62 seconds after a successful conversion. All of these upgrades are very useful for your monks to function well. In Castle Age, Sanctity is the first tech that you usually get. 
being able to tank a few extra hits from enemies increases your chances of getting a conversion, so it can be the difference between your monks converting the enemy or the enemy killing your monk. This makes knights kill monks in 5 instead of 3 hits, light cav go to 3 from 2 hits, and most importantly mangonels go to 2 from 1 hit. For fervor, increasing movement speed is a bit more difficult to quantify. Monks moving faster can be helpful when taking relics before your opponent does, but it's also great for getting your monks to the front lines faster to heal and get conversions. Your monks are useless if they can't even get to the fight in time. Moving faster also helps you to save monks that get out of position. If your monks can walk just a bit faster then you might be able to get your army in position to save them, or reach a building to garrison into. Since Fervor is super cheap, just saving one or two monks because of it already makes it pay off. Block printing is an Imperial Age tech, unlike Sanctity and Fervor, so you can only get it if the game goes late. Since the upgrade is cheap and 3 range is a lot, getting block printing as soon as you reach Imp is often worth it if you have some monks. Converting from a longer range will give the monks a longer time until the enemies reach them, which can pretty much guarantee conversions sometimes. It's especially useful against siege units such as onagers and bombard cannons, as these units are very expensive and can cause a lot of destruction after they've been converted. Without the extra 3 range, it can be difficult to secure these conversions. Illumination is another Imperial Age tech that's super cheap and useful. It makes your monks take 33 seconds to rest instead of 62 seconds after a successful conversion, so they're ready to convert again faster. This can sometimes let you get multiple conversions with the same monks in drawn out battles, which are common in the Imperial Age. There aren't really many situations where it's necessary to have, as it doesn't affect your monks utility at the start of the fight, but since it's really cheap you should always consider getting it if you plan to use monks to convert in Imperial Age. Alright, next up are the techs that allow your monks to convert a wider range of targets. Atonement lets you convert enemy monks, and Redemption lets you convert most enemy buildings and all siege units. Atonement is very situational as you and your opponent have to be making monks and those monks have to be the highest priority target for your conversions. Since monks cost only 100 resources and are in the back line, it can be better to convert other units that have higher value and are in the front line such as knights. Atonement is most commonly used on arena to contest relics when both players mainly have monks. Without Atonement, monks have no way of dealing with enemy monks, so you may be forced to watch an enemy monk take away a relic before your eyes. The first one to get Atonement in a monk war will win easily. Another thing to mention is that converted monks retain their faith, so if you convert a monk that has 100% faith, you can use that monk right away to convert something else. This can lead to a chain reaction where you convert all of your enemy's monks as they can't get away from the 9 range. The next upgrade, Redemption, can completely change how you play with or against monks if you or your opponent's Civ gets it. Redemption lets your monks convert buildings and siege units. This makes your monks go from being useless against siege units to hard countering them. The cost of 475 gold seems like a lot at first, but after converting just one mangonel, the tech has already paid for itself. There are a few exceptions to how redemption works, so it's not completely overpowered. Rams, trebuchets, and buildings require the monk to be directly next to them to be converted. This at least gives the defending player a few options for siege units against monks. Onagers, bombard cannons, and scorpions are all susceptible to monks with redemption, so you have to be very careful with these units if you're up against monks. The other exception is that certain buildings cannot be converted, even with redemption. Town centers, castles, crepos, all walls and gates, monasteries, wonders, farms, and fish traps cannot be converted. Any building not on this list can be converted, so yes, you can convert enemy towers. Converting a Phaetoria also gives you a trickle of resources as if you had built it yourself, as well as filling up 20 population space. Donjons can also be converted, but you can't train sergeants from them unless you're also Sicilians. It's worth mentioning here that only two unit lines get natural conversion resistance, Scouts and Eagle Warriors. These units have a longer minimum and maximum conversion time, so you'll have a harder time converting them. Since those are the only two units with conversion resistance, it follows that Siege and Ships are converted at the same rate as all other units. 
Oh, and also ships do not require redemption to be converted, even cannon galleons. On the topic of conversion resistance, there are two techs in the monastery that will help when going against monks. The Castle Age tech Heresy, and the Imperial Age tech Faith. Heresy makes converted units die instead of turning to the opponent's side, and Faith increases all of your unit's conversion resistance, meaning increasing the minimum and maximum conversion times. Both of these techs are very expensive, so they're only worth it when against mass monks, or when you have expensive units that you just can't afford to let your opponent have. The only civilization that has elephant units to get heresy is the Malay, but every elephant civ does get faith. These techs are most commonly used to help against monk all-ins on arena, and to prevent your onagers from killing each other. Kesingen did a video on heresy where he makes his argument for why it's not actually unaffordable sometimes, so you can check the link in the description for that later. The final tech you can get to improve your monks is Theocracy. This makes it so that when you use multiple monks to convert a single target, only one monk has to rest after a successful conversion. This helps you to get more fast as possible conversions, because you can use multiple monks to convert a single target. It is, of course, the fastest monk that has to rest, so once that happens, you can get all of the other monks to target another unit. Monks with Theocracy also work with Shift Q Micro. You can set up a chain of conversions, and your monks will convert them in succession. I've already gone over how Shift Q Micro works in another video, so you can also watch that one after this one if you want to learn more on how to use Theocracy in game. There's just one more tech in the monastery, and that's Herbal Medicine. This is the only tech here that has nothing to do with monks. It increases the passive healing of units in buildings by 500%. Though this is a lot, healing smaller numbers of units with monks can still be faster. Keeping your units inside buildings instead of being active with them can also be a mistake, as this lets your opponent sit back and relax, which will let them make better decisions. For comparison, units inside town centers, towers, and donjons heal at a rate of 6 HP per minute. Inside castles and crepos, that number is doubled to 12 HP per minute. With herbal medicine, the rates are multiplied by 6 to 36 and 72 HP per minute. Monks heal at a rate of 150 HP per minute, so for the cost of herbal medicine, you could have two monks which will be very effective at healing and have other uses as well. Since the tech was made cheaper from 350 gold, it can be strong in certain situations, but monks still tend to be easier to make work. Moving on from monastery techs, let's take a look at the various bonuses that different civilizations have for monks. I'll just go through them in alphabetical order, so this isn't a ranking of usefulness or anything. Aztecs get plus 5 HP on their monks per monastery tech researched. This lets them get up to a maximum of 75 HP in Castle Age and 95 HP in Imperial Age. This insane level of tankiness lets them deal with pretty much anything, even the units that are supposed to counter them. When playing against Aztec monks, getting heresy is necessary before taking a fight. Since Aztecs don't have cavalry, don't have halberdier, and don't have thumbring, they don't really have the greatest options for dealing with massed heavy cavalry in the late game, other than monks, so their monks being almost too strong balances out the sieve. Aztecs also gets another bonus to encourage you to play monks. Their relics generate 33% more gold. This means that 3 Aztec relics is equivalent to 4 standard relics. This works very well for them, as American civs lack the scout cavalry line, which makes them more reliant on gold in the late game. Another high tier monk civ is the Bohemians. Their entire tech tree is filled with strong bonuses that help with monk play. The Bohemians used to get their monasteries for 75 wood, which let them get 4 monasteries for the price of 2, but that bonus was removed since this made their monk play almost unstoppable on arena. This wasn't even their only good bonus for their monk play though. Bohemians also get gold mining and gold shaft mining upgrade for free. Since monks only cost gold, this really helps with this strategy. If the opponent tries to counter the Bohemians with light cavalry, the Bohemians have another powerful bonus against them. Their spearmen line gets an additional 25% bonus damage, so spearmen go from 5 to 4 hits, and pikemen go from 4 to 3 hits to kill a light cav with bloodlines. This is functionally free pikemen upgrade versus the light cavalry, with the option of making your spearmen even stronger. 
Since the bonus damage is the main reason to even upgrade to pikemen, skipping this upgrade in favor of more spearmen can be preferred. More units will do a better job of blocking enemy cavalry from getting to the monks, and with so many monks healing the spearmen, having the extra HP from the pikemen upgrade is not significant. If cavalry won't work against bohemians, then maybe you could try mass longswordsmen. The problem with this is that longswordsmen are slow, so they still aren't that great of a counter, but even if they could work, bohemians get chemistry and hand cannoneers in Castle Age. This lets them very easily counter your infantry, as hand cannons require no upgrades to be good, other than chemistry of course. All of these bonuses are huge, but we're not yet done with bohemians. Fervor and sanctity affect villagers as well as your monks. Increasing the movement speed of your villagers decreases their time carrying resources and increases the time collecting them. This improves your entire economy, even just by a little. Giving your villagers an extra 15 HP can let them tank just a little bit more damage, which can be the difference between life and death for them. In conjunction with the extra HP, the movement speed also helps your villagers to get away from enemy units. Another side effect of Bohemians getting chemistry in Castle Age is that they can build bombard cannons instantly on Imperial Age, so if your plan is to rush to Imperial Age to push the Bohemian monks away with trebuchets, by the time you get your trebs out, the Bohemian player will already be able to counter you with bombard cannons. Oh yeah, and also Bohemians can upgrade their bombard cannons to Hufnitze, which gives them more HP, more blast radius, and an extra pierce armor. Since your trebs are useless against the Bohemian Bombard Cannons, you could try to build your own BBC, but then the Bohemians just have better Bombard Cannons, as well as a million monks with block printing and redemption, so this plan is doomed to fail. Bohemians have one more significant bonus for their monks. Their unique Imperial tech is Hussite Reforms. You know how gold is really valuable in 1v1s, and monks cost 100 gold each? Well, Hussite Reforms makes your monks and monastery techs only cost food. With this tech, you can spam monks like hussars in the late game, so your opponent will never be able to rest with the constant conversion sound playing. Where are your monks? Are they on the front converting army? Stealing your sneak stable? Raiding a neutral gold mine? The answer is all of the above. For a sieve that has no bonuses directly affecting the stats of their monks, Bohemians sure does have a big incentive to make a lot of them. I guess this just goes to show how strong monks are, even without buffing the unit itself. Enough about Bohemians, let's move on to the next one. The next sieve only gets a small bonus for relics. Burgundian relics generate food in addition to gold. The rate at which food is generated is the same as gold at 30 per minute. Villagers with handcart generate 24 food per minute, and villagers with gold shaft mining collect 30 gold per minute. Each Burgundian relic is therefore worth more than two villagers. Picking up relics with Burgundians is a great way to bolster their already strong economy. Burmese is yet another sieve with a relic bonus, but that's not their only one. They get all of their monastery techs at half price, as well as having the locations of all relics revealed from the start of the game. Knowing the location of the relics can help to predict where the opponent's town center is, as relics don't spawn too close to a player's starting TC. The discounted techs really help you to afford the more expensive ones such as Redemption and Heresy, but they also let you pick up the cheaper ones such as Sanctity and Fervor, even if you're only making a few monks. Since you also get your wood upgrades for free, adding a monastery in early castle age is not a huge investment. The next sieve is my personal favorite, the Byzantines. They only get one bonus for their monks, and that's that their monks heal twice as fast. They go from 150 to 300 HP per minute. This is great for keeping your army of cataphracts alive, especially when gold is running low on the map. Since it's a team bonus, it also lets your allies monks heal faster. Chinese get a discount on all of their technologies, so they save 15% in Castle Age and 20% in Imperial Age on their monastery techs. They lack redemption, so their monks really aren't all that great despite the discounts, but they're still a bit better than generic in certain situations. Hun's monks are really not that great, but that's not why they're being mentioned here. Hun's Imperial Age tech, Atheism, increases the time for wonder and relic victories by 100 years, which is 8 minutes and 20 seconds in-game time. A secondary effect was added to this tech to make it useful when playing with the Conquest Victory condition, which is the most common way to play the game. It cuts the relic generation rate for enemies in half, 
So if they have two relics, it's like they only have one. The more relics your opponent has, the more useful this tech is. Lithuanians have a few reasons to build monks. Their knights and lightest get plus one attack per relic collected up to a maximum of four. Since Lithuanians don't get Blast Furnace, they have to collect two relics to make up for this. The fact that Lithuanians can collect relics in Castle Age means that their knights can be extremely strong in the mid-game. Lithuanians' other bonus is that their monasteries work 20% faster. This applies to monks and monastery technologies. 20% faster is like five monasteries working like six. Since the Lithuanian bonus is a team bonus, it's fine that it's a bit underwhelming. The next sieve is barely worth mentioning, and that's the Malians. They get a 26 wood discount on their monasteries. I suppose this could be enough of a discount for you to make one in early castle age to pick up relics fast, but it's not a huge bonus. Malians only lack illumination though, so their monks are perfectly workable. Up next is the Portuguese. Their gold cost of their units is discounted by 20%, which brings their monks down to 80 gold each. They also get their technologies researching 30% faster. It's pretty common to go crossbowmen with Portuguese, so picking up quicker sanctity and redemption can help you to counter enemy mangonels that are built to counter your crossbowmen. Sicilians don't have any monk bonuses, and actually their monks aren't that great, but their Castle Age unique tech, First Crusade, has a similar effect to Faith. In addition to spawning 7 sergeants from each town center up to 5 town centers, it gives all units conversion resistance. The next sieve on the list is very unique, and when I say unique, I mean that they have a unique monk unit. The Spanish have a few things going for them in the monastery department. Their unique tech, Inquisition, makes their monks convert enemy units faster. At only 100 food and 300 gold, it can be worth getting fairly early. Unlike the previous sieves, the Spanish Conquistador is actually worth building in early Castle Age, so picking up the Castle Age tech after opening with conks is very smooth. Now, on to what makes Spanish monks really great. They have access to every monastery tech as well as the donkey riding missionary. Missionaries benefit from all techs that monks benefit from, as well as husbandry and bloodlines from the stable. My favorite strategy with Spanish, which I call Conk and Donk, opens with a castle and a monastery in Castle Age to build a few conquistadors and missionaries. Since you'll want bloodlines and husbandry for your conquistadors, missionaries are much more compatible with conks than monks are. With husbandry and fervor, missionaries are faster than knights and almost as fast as light cavalry. With good micro, you can pick off your opponent's army and then heal your weak units, leading to a snowball victory. Since both Conk and Donk are fast, you can always run from bad engagements. It's like cavalry archers, except your units can kill siege, convert buildings, and convert villagers that can make a siege workshop inside of your opponent's base. Missionaries cost 100 gold and train in 51 seconds, just like monks. Their only downsides are that they have two less conversion range, can't pick up relics, and take bonus damage from spearmen. The fact that they're fast and relatively tanky means that they can pull this maneuver off, where monks most certainly could not. The final sieve on the list is the Teutons. They get a team bonus which increases conversion resistance for all units, and a sieve bonus which gives their monks double the healing range from 4 to 8. The conversion resistance bonus is their most well-known one, as it's common knowledge that you're going to have a hard time going monks against Teutons. Teutons also get access to Heresy and Faith, so they're a really great anti-monk sieve. They're missing a few things that would put them over the edge though. No Husbandry and no Light Cav or Hussar makes it more difficult to reach the enemy monks, and then take longer to kill the monks once your scouts are there. Since your scouts also have extra melee armor, if they do get converted, your scouts that haven't been converted yet will spend longer killing converted scouts and less time killing monks. The healing range bonus is a surprisingly good passive bonus. Your monks can remain well in the backline healing your knights while they fight. Since knights only have 4 line of sight, your opponent might not even realize that you have monks healing, and might misread that fight. Okay, now that we know all about how monks work, and the various bonuses that you can get for them, let's go over some real situations that you might use them in. On Arabia, monks are used mainly as a support unit. 
They can be great for healing up weak knights, converting enemy knights over walls, and collecting relics to secure an advantage in the late game. With Redemption and Sanctity, they can completely shut down Mangonel pushes, and with the help of your own Mangonels, you can deal with enemy rams as well. This is why Siege and Monks complement each other so well. They tend to cover each other's weaknesses. When making Siege and Monks aggressively or defensively, you're still vulnerable to Light Cavalry, so you have to be careful of those. Adding another unit such as Knights, Crossbowmen, or Pikemen can help against Light Cav. Since mobility is so important on Arabia, if you have monks on the map, they will be easy for your opponent to pick off. They move really slowly, so they're best used to hold positions such as when defending your base or sieging. When defending your base with monks, building the monastery close to your town center is usually the best position for it. This way you can garrison monks in the town center if your opponent has units running around your base. The reason you'll want to garrison your monks is so that you don't lose them after a conversion where they're just standing around anyways. These days, you can set up your conversions and then select all of your monks and issue a shift garrison command so they jump in the town center as soon as they finish converting. Your monks will still recharge while in the TC, so after another 62 seconds, you can ungarrison them and go for another conversion. Another way that you can use your town center here is to teleport your monks so they can keep trying to convert if your opponent targets them. If you retreat a monk into the TC and let him out the back door, he can force the opponent's knights to chase teleporting monks around instead of doing something that actually hurts you. Knights are fast, but they can't beat magic. Not only is this micro good against knights, it can also be used to surprise your opponent with sneak redemption. If you're getting siege pushed, then loading some monks into your TC and ungarrisoning just as the mangonels fire at your TC can lead to unavoidable conversions on the mangonels. You'll need sanctity for this tactic as well as redemption, as sanctity lets your monks tank two hits instead of one. The cost is 175 wood for the monastery, 120 gold for sanctity, 475 gold for redemption, and 200 to 300 gold for two or three monks. The total cost is 970 or 1070 resources. For the Mangonel player, the cost is 200 wood for the Siege Workshop and 160 wood, 135 gold per Mangonel. With two Mangonels, the cost is already 790 resources, and with three, it goes up to 1085 resources. If you can invest a similar number of resources to your opponent to completely shut down his aggression, then that's a very efficient use of those resources. Not to mention that your monks have other utility after stopping the initial siege as well. Right away, you can convert the opponent's siege workshop and any nearby houses. Then you can go take relics or keep your monks back to defend other aggression. Keeping monks at home to heal your units can be especially useful. If you pull back low HP knights throughout the mid-game and heal them, then even if it seems like you're trading evenly in battles, you'll end up with an army advantage later. On Arena, the way to use monks can be completely different. Since there's only one main attack path down the center, the lack of mobility for monks is less of an issue. A very common strategy here is to go fast castle into monks to contest relics. Since the defender's advantage is great on this map because of stone walls, the games often go long. In these situations, securing more relics than your opponent can be very important. The player that takes more relics can outlast the opponent when gold runs out, so they might choose to play more defensively, especially if they have a favorable Civ matchup. Another reason to go for relics early is that you have all of Dark and Feudal Age to scout them out, so you know exactly where to send your monks. Monks are also very powerful when used aggressively on Arena. Since monks are inexpensive, have long range, and counter almost every unit, they can be used to box your opponent in his base. Some arena generations have little space inside the base, so if your opponent controls the front with monks, you might run out of space for farms and production in your base. You can also have a map where your golds and stones are forward, so losing the front of your base can put you in a tricky situation. As the Monks player, if you scout that your opponent has his internal stone forward, you can push without the risk of attacking into a castle unless your opponent takes stone early. If your opponent does get a castle or guard towers up, getting to Imperial Age and adding in Bombard Cannons or Trebuchets can help keep your push going. For Monk Rushes, you'll want to get to Castle Age as soon as possible and then build your monasteries forward. 
monks take around twice as long as other units to train, so you really want to have three or four monasteries to have enough production to overwhelm your opponent. Since monks can't convert walls, you also need to add in rams or a castle to get through. Monks can easily prevent your opponent from walling behind the wall that's being destroyed because they're long range and the fact that you can't evade the monk's attack. The rams are also necessary to take out town centers and monasteries which can't be converted. Light cavalry is the most likely unit that your opponent will make against your monks, so if you expect light cavalry, you can add spearmen to protect your monks, as well as position your monks in places where the light cav won't be able to take a good fight. You should have a forward villager or two which built your forward monasteries, so you can make some choke points out of buildings for your monks to sit in. There are many ways to micro monks, a few of which we've already looked at earlier. In this section, we'll look at some more advanced techniques to really use your monks to their fullest potential. First up is charging conversions. If you get a monk to convert something, then it will retain its charge if you target something else. This means that when switching targets, there's no penalty in terms of how fast your monk will convert. This only works if you don't issue a movement command. If you tell your monk to move somewhere, or your monk stops because its target is too far away, then the charge is reset. There are many ways to use this mechanic, but I'll just go through the three most common ones. Anytime you're not using control groups to get fast conversions, you can get a group of monks to start on one target and then switch targets with individual monks until they're all on separate targets. This requires you to do this pretty fast, so I'd recommend only using three or four monks at a time for this. Another common use for charged retargeting is when your opponent sends light cavalry to snipe monks, and then knights in later. If you charge your monks on light cav who have conversion resistance, then you'll very likely get some instant conversions when retargeting a knight. The other common use for this uses the same concept. Since buildings have a very slow conversion time, you can comfortably charge up on them and then even insta-convert light cav. As I said, as long as you don't issue a movement command or your monk stops moving or trying to convert, the charge is retained. Using enemy buildings, you can retain your charge for as long as necessary by moving between them. If you can understand this mechanic, you'll be sure to frustrate some of your opponents with insta-conversions. The next technique is shift queuing. We already saw this in action a few times in this video, but it's worth mentioning again. Monks with Theocracy can be shift queued to the next target to move on once the current target is converted. The monk's charge is not carried over, however. You can also get your monks to convert units that are raiding your base, and then shift garrison into your town center so that they hop in once they're done converting. Monk retention in early to mid castle age is extremely important, so this is something worth practicing. Another great use of shift converting is when knights are attacking your walls and you want to get close first in order to increase your chances of getting a conversion. Knights have low line of sight, so you can get your monk in pretty close before your opponent can even react. Just tell your monk to move next to the wall, and then shift queue a conversion onto a knight. If your opponent doesn't react instantly, or just has bad luck, one of his knights will be yours. There's one thing that you must learn how to do if you want to effectively control a large group of monks. Setting each monk into a control group will let you select individual monks quickly so that you can get them converting faster. The setup process can take a lot of time if you do it normally. Clicking a monk, setting it, clicking another monk, setting it, and so on takes too long and requires a lot of precision with your mouse. The fastest and easiest way to set up your control groups is to select all of your monks, set them all to a control group, then control click the leftmost monk to remove it from the selection, then set the next control group, and repeat. Units can only be in one control group at a time, so you end up with just one in each group except the last control group you set. When you go to take a fight, you can now quickly select your monks to convert different targets. It's better to spend more time setting up your monks before a fight than spending more time during the fight. If you can master setting monk control groups, then you'll be able to get much more out of them. In addition to manually converting and control grouping your monks, there's another notable method of using them. When using a large group of monks, the fastest way to get conversions is to physically group them together and then spam the go to idle military hotkey. This will jump your camera to and select an idle military unit. Since the camera moves, it can be very difficult to be accurate with this method. This is why you want all of your monks to be in roughly the same spot. 
The less the camera moves, the more accurate you will be since you want to keep your cursor in about the same spot every time you click. You don't have time to aim. Just spray and pray, as they say. Since you're using the go to idle military command, you have to make sure that all of your other units are doing something before using this technique. This is simple to do though, as you just press the select all military hotkey, patrol them forward, and then select all of your monks and press stop. At this point, you're ready to start rapid fire converting. There's one final mechanic for micro that I want to present. When converting a unit, it usually tries to attack the monk if it's close enough to see it. Villagers work differently though. If a villager is tasked to do anything except attack or repair, it will try to run away from the monk. There are a few ways to exploit this. If your opponent is trying to collect resources and you have a monk near, you can spam conversions on each of the villagers to make them go idle. This can be a very effective and very annoying tactic. The other way to use this is when denying a forward castle. You just have to recite this magic spell. By the power of Lord Doubt, our woes become sorted. From devious construction, all foes are thwarted. Before peasants revolt and thine coffers run dry, two choices are clear, convert or die. If you lack poetic prowess, you can also just spam click conversions on all enemy villagers. That works too. To counter this as the castle dropper, you have to spam click the castle foundation so that your villagers don't run away from their duties. Every time that you tell your villagers to build, the construction stops for a frame, so you don't want to click too fast, otherwise you end up building even slower. The same idea applies when rushing up a tower. Spam clicking the building foundation actually makes it build slower, so you want to only reissue the command on villagers that are being disrupted. I've got a link to a T-West video for more information on this mechanic. The last thing I want to talk about is a little bit of trivia. What happens to units that are garrisoned in something that gets converted? For transport ships, the units remain inside the ship and your opponent can choose to drop them off if they want. These units still take up population space, so keeping them hostage is usually better than killing them. For siege towers, rams, and buildings, the units are automatically ejected. What happens to a relic if a transport ship with a monk carrying a relic inside is destroyed? The game tries to find nearby land and the relic washes up on the shoreline. Can monks garrison inside rams or siege towers? The answer is surprisingly no. Every other unit that walks, including villagers, can go inside, but not monks. How many monks do you need to outheal the damage dealt by a knight? Monks heal at a rate of 150 HP per minute and 75 HP per minute after the first one. Knights take away 333 HP per minute without upgrades and 366 HP per minute with forging. Using these numbers, we can determine that you need 4 monks to outheal the damage dealt to them by a single knight. Though monks can't convert farms and fish traps, they can heal them. This costs wood as if you were repairing with a villager. Unlike healing units with monks and repairing buildings with villagers, when you use a monk to heal a farm, the rate at which it's healed is not constant. It's based on the maximum HP of the building. If you begin a conversion before Theocracy or Illumination completes and the upgrade finishes before you get a successful conversion, the upgrade effect still works. Putting your army in box formation will make the monks stand in the center, which can help protect them. This kind of micro isn't normally used, but I think the concept has potential in some situations. Thanks for watching this long video on monks. You should have the tools you need to get started using monks. Now, it's just about gaining experience using them in game. It takes some practice to become proficient with using monks, but the more times you try using them, the more value you'll get out of them. Thank you so much for watching until the end, and I'll see you in the next one.